Please take your seats. The program will begin in five minutes. Please take your seats. Our program will now begin. ASEAN is made up of 10 diverse markets with one of the fastest growing digital landscapes, manufacturing hubs and abundant natural resources. With our knowledge and insights on local markets, Standard Chartered can help you accelerate your growth and navigate the complexities of each market. As you expand across ASEAN, we can support you with end-to-end -end solutions, streamlining processes across multiple jurisdictions, making it more efficient for you. To support the growing cashless ecosystem, we've digitized our cash management. From virtual accounts to a wide range of APIs, we've optimized digitization for your transaction and reporting needs. As your trusted banking partner, we are committed to supporting your growth ambitions, co-creating innovative and winning solutions with you. Please welcome to the stage, Bloomberg's Haslinda Amin. joining us. Uh, it's great to see everybody without masks. I mean, it's my first um, conference where I can see everybody's face and you're looking good. Now, the world is grappling with multiple risks. A war, elevated inflation, rising interest rates, 
A looming recession, in fact, one may be just on the way in Europe. Some say it's quite a certain. We have an energy crisis, a food crisis, a climate crisis. Add to that, China is slowing, and the dollar is king. It's pummeling just about every currency out there. Against this backdrop, how would Southeast Asia, a region of 10 nations, navigate an increasingly challenging environment? How does it capitalize on 700 million people, a rising middle class? And how does it coordinate, cooperate with each other to realize the full potential of the region? So I thank you for coming together today to join us as we discuss recovery and resilience, spotlight on ASEAN business. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge the support of our presenting sponsor, Standard Chartered. Thank you, Bill, thank you. And just a few housekeeping notes to tell you about. For our virtual attendees, if you experience any issues with audio or video quality, all you need to do is refresh, refresh, refresh. If that fails, go to the chat box in the bottom right corner of your screen. You'll get some support there. We'll also have Q&A. You can submit your questions to our panelists. There will be a live polling session as well. If you're here, all you need to do is to refer to your QR code on your badge. You'll be able to submit your questions and answers there. For our virtual audience, you may submit your questions to our speakers via the Ask Our Speakers chat box. Again, it is a chat box for our virtual uh, participants. We'd love for you to engage on social media, whether it is Twitter, whether it is LinkedIn, Facebook. I'm tempted to say this is not the crowd for TikTok, but also on TikTok. Please engage with us. And the hashtag is Spotlight on ASEAN. That's one word. We're all warmed up. Let's begin. I'd like to invite on stage Standard Chartered Asia CEO, Benjamin Hung. Ben, please. Please welcome to the stage, Standard Chartered Asia CEO, Benjamin Hung. Let me move this up a little bit. Okay. The Honorable Sri Muliani, the Honorable Tenku Zafal, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Standard Chartered, a real warm welcome to the ASEAN Business Forum. It's great to see all of you, actually mostly here, uh, physically here in the Shangri-La, but also uh, online via the telecast. We are meeting at a critical time. On the one hand, the world is faced with quite a diverse set of critical challenges, ranging from disrupted finance, uh, supply chain, dis disrupted oil prices, energy prices, geopolitical tensions remain quite high, and we do have the lingering effects of the pandemic, as well as rising recessionary risks. Now, on the other hand, we are seeing some transformational and structural trends presenting quite an attractive set of uh, opportunities, especially here in Asia. There is, as I see it, the growing interconnectivity in intra-Asian trade and capital flows. The fourth industrial revolution is bringing about new business models and helping all of us to move up, move up the value chain through digital transformation. And then there's the acceleration of green transition via concerted commitments and a lot of sustainability efforts by a lot of people. And within Asia, we see ASEAN as an oasis of growth, where we are presented with an abundance of diverse opportunities. As I said, just said, uh, this region is home to about 700 million people with around two and a half trillion GDP, 
And from a track record perspective, over the last 15 years, it has steadfastly been delivering 5.5% compounded GDP growth throughout the last 15 years, obviously underpinned by a very, very young and rising middle class population. It is also on track to become one of the world's largest trading bloc, benefiting from global supply chains, particularly from the China plus one type of policies and, and approaches, and also benefiting, benefiting from RCEP, which covers approximately 30% of global, global GDP and trade, facilitating greater open trade and investment flows. As I see it, ASEAN is one of the very, very few economic blocks around the world where every major economic superpower is keen to develop a closer relationship with. The US is keen, the Europeans are keen, the Chinese are keen, and of course within Asia, most of us are also keen to develop a closer relationship across the ASEAN opportunities. And as I said earlier, there are also massive sustainable financing and green infrastructure demands that will also generate immense opportunities across ASEAN. Now, capturing ASEAN's full potential will require private and public collaboration to bring about both synergies as well as to remove barriers. Which is really the purpose of this forum is really to bring about greater connectivity in terms of integrating, hopefully to support the collective goal of bringing about collectively sustainable, resilient, and more inclusive growth going forward. And over the coming session this afternoon, we will hear from dis distinguished panelists and speakers that will discuss about the emerging trends and hopefully winning formulas to take ASEAN to the next chapter. And as the only international bank which operates in all 10 ASEAN markets, we are very, very keen to help and support our clients grow and for them to capture opportunities to the fullest potential. It is a real privilege to be part of this conference, and I wish you all the best and hopefully have a wonderful and enjoyable afternoon. Thank you very much. Please welcome Tanku Zafrul Aziz, Malaysian Finance Minister, Sri Mulyani Indrawati, Indonesian Finance Minister, and Standard Charter Group CEO, Bill Winters, for a conversation with Bloomberg's Haslinda Amin. Just to remind you that you can submit your questions. Make them very difficult ones, OK? <laughs> We've been talking about how the world is clouded by all sorts of risks, uh, inflation, higher rates, um, the strong dollar. First of all, Ibu Shri, thank you for joining us virtually. Good to see you. Good to see you, too, Ms. Linda. Hi, Bill, and thank you, Sabro. <laughs> Let we miss you, you here, all. by the way. Hope to see you in person soon. Yeah. The first question goes to uh, Mr. Zafrul. You've acknowledged that the external environment has changed. You're expecting moderation in terms of demand. How is Malaysia positioning for it? I mean, we know that you're about to announce your budget soon, right? October 7th, I think, has been brought forward. Give us a sense of what your priority areas are and what key issues are you trying to address? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you, Hasinda, for having me and with this uh, very esteemed list of guess, three, three uh, panelists. But first of all, um, it's going to be a challenging year, 2023. Uh, budget, of course, is on the 7th of October. Um, we are facing uh, various uh, challenges even now, even today. I mean, as, as they said just today, we are looking at uh, the strengthening of the dollar, the slowing down of the uh, global economy. But for Malaysia, uh, we are on track for this year, uh, 2022. Um, GDP growth will be uh, perhaps or even higher than what we had anticipated it to be. Uh, How much higher? Our official forecast uh, is 6.3 to 7.3 percent. I think we will uh, probably surpass that. We've seen the second quarter growth uh, at 8.9 percent and third quarter 
looks like even stronger than that. Um, so we should be on track to, to beat the, uh, the, the forecast that we have uh, anticipated earlier. Um, that the new number will be announced, uh, unfortunately, as in the, on the 7th of October. I can't say it today. Um, but we, what also important is infl inf inflation. Inflation in Malaysia is now around 2.8% for the first seven months. Our monetary policy remains accommodative, uh, although the Bank Nagara has just increased OPR, our rate by 25 basis points to 2.5%. It's still lower than what it was uh, before the crisis, which was around 3 to 3.25%. So Malaysia this year uh, will be on track. Um, subsidies has helped. Uh, subsidies going to be uh, in the region of 80 billion ringgit, as close to 20 billion US dollars. Is the highest ever uh, subsidy uh, done in, in, in a budget or in a year, um, and this has helped maintain that uh, inflationary rate. And, and unemployment also has gone down. Unemployment today, uh, last week we announced unemployment is now back to our natural rate of unemployment at around 3.7 percent from its peak of 5.3 percent. Um, so this year. Um, we are fortunate to see where we are today. Of course, uh, Malaysia being a net exporter of commodities have helped, right? Uh, where oil prices is, palm oil prices, uh, exports, we are part of the integral part of the supply chain for uh, manufacturing uh, of E&E, &E, for example, that you know, accounts close to 40% of our exports. So that has, has helped uh, Malaysia uh, this year. But next year, as you have uh, correctly, or well, many are anticipating it's going to be a tougher year. Uh, so the, for the budget next year, it's going to be focusing on four uh, pillars. We're going to focus on people. It's going to be focusing on uh, business, economy, and the government. Uh, and it's going to focus also uh, on three key areas. One is to maintain the momentum uh, of economic uh, growth, uh, which we have achieved this year. It's going to be more difficult. We we'll probably have we'll see a moderation in GDP growth for Malaysia. Secondly, is to make sure that the growth is sustainable and inclusive. And thirdly, it's about being fiscal responsible, uh, fisc responsibly, fisc uh, sorry, fisc about fiscal responsibility. Uh, that's why we're also focusing on our new Fiscal Responsibility Act. Uh, at this point, uh, Minister Shrimuliani, I want to bring you into the conversation. We talked about uh, the risk of inflation. And of course, there are murmurings out there that Indonesia's inflation could be looking at 7 to 8%. I mean, what are your own thoughts on that? And going forward, even uh, Governor Wajio has said that 4%, keeping it below 4 will be a challenge. She likened it to trying to bend over backwards like an acrobat just to get to that level. Well, um, the pressure from uh, both food and energy prices is actually quite uh, severe uh, from uh, many uh, different countries, in this case, including Indonesia. So if you look at the Indonesia inflation uh, last month, uh, August is 4.9, going down a little bit to 4.6%. Deflation usually happen in September. But if you look at the component of the inflation, it's mainly coming from the volatile food, which is uh, we can explain, for example, from wheat and many other uh, uh, cooking oil, which is also have a very high really correlation with the geopolitical situation. So if you look at the underlying inflation, which is related to the core inflation, which is demand driven, it's actually still at 3%. So the question from the policy point of view, how we are going to respond to the, poli uh, to the inflation, which is mainly coming from the supply disruption. Uh, this morning, for example, uh, President, this is, uh, have already many time now discussing with uh, all governor as well as the municipal uh, mayor uh, of the cities in order for us to be able to go through, through the detail where the pressure of this price is coming from, especially for the food prices, which is, I think, can be prevented. While on energy price, as you know, that uh, last week, we've already announced the adjustment increase uh, at the average of 30% of the subsidized uh, uh, fuel, fossil fuel, which, of course, it will release a little bit of pressure on the budget. Uh, but on the other hand, this is also will uh, increase the administered price inflation coming from this adjustment. So we try to make sure that first, if the issue is coming from the supply side, we are going to address on the supply side. Of course, Bank Indonesia, as the authority on the monetary side, they also have to establish a policy which is uh, going to be able to manage the inflation expectation as well as the stability of uh, rupiah in this case. 
as mentioned earlier uh, by the Gusaf rule, that we are all facing with a very strong dollars, but Indonesia depreciation is uh, around 4.5%. This year, which is relatively uh, actually mild or moderate comparing to many other countries. This is because of our performance on uh, external balance, on uh, balance of payment is actually quite good. The trade uh, account has been surplus for 27 months. So we have uh, more resiliency on the external side. But we do know that uh, the situation globally is not going to be easy. It's going to be much more complicated with the potential of increasing interest rate uh, by Federal Reserve, by ECB, which is going to be followed by the maybe recession in this case, and also keep very volatile, uncertain price of the co uh, the energy because of geopolitics. So we are going to be really prepared and go through the detail of the uh, uh, policy rather than tinkering only on the macro side. But the macro policy prudential framework still continue to be maintained will not be adequate. We have to go down into the detail to the regional, to the commodity, as well as to the source of the uh, price uh, pressure. As you said, you raised uh, subsidized fuel by about 30% just last week. Is it one and done? Might you be under pressure to raise prices further, given that um, expenses spending may be rising? Well, we are estimating for this uh, fiscal year, while at the same time this month, and that's why I cannot attend uh, this forum because we are still in the middle of discussion with the parliament regarding our uh, budget for next year. Uh, for this year, uh, this increase uh, of 30% of two commodities, that is solar as well as petalite, will be adequate to at least uh, compensating the increasing the fuel price, which is even above uh, $100 per barrel average for the first eight months. Now uh, we can see that uh, oil price slightly declined, but we are not really sure where, where this is going to go, uh, whether it's going to be uh, down into the 90s and continue there or going down again, or it's going to be like entering winter in which this has become one of the commodity uh, which is becoming very political globally. So it is not really sure where the oil globally is going to go, but uh, at this very moment, I think what we've already uh, taken a step uh, for adjusting the oil price uh, last week, I think will be adequate uh, to at least save the not only budget first. I think the focus of our policy is try to maintain the momentum of recovery by protecting the people purchasing power. So the increase is not going to be extreme. But at the same time, we also make sure that our budget is going to be also safe and uh, credible and sustainable in the medium long run. So we are uh, aiming for these three very important objectives. And uh, the decision which is being made last week, I think uh, serving those well. That is uh, protecting still the people because we are still subsidizing. Second one, uh, also still maintaining the recovery of the economy, which is also very strong on the second quarter and will continue expected to be on the third quarter. Right. And at the same time, also saving and creating a sustainability and credibility of our own budget because of the subsidy uh, burden is already uh, very extreme at this very moment. Bill, when we last spoke, you said that if there is a recession, it will be shallow. But since we last spoke, I mean, the data out of China has gone from bad to worse. The energy crisis in Europe, well, has deepened. Have we, I guess, misassessed the depth um, of the problems in China as well as Europe? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's, that is the big question of the day. And uh, I, I think the, 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 to continue your, your stream of news, I think the U.S. has probably been more resilient uh, than we might have thought in the face of the early phase of interest rate increases. Uh, the, uh, and I, I say that because of the, the ongoing strength in job growth. Now, on, on the one hand, that's a good sign for the U.S. economy, which therefore for the global economy. Of course, it will fuel inflation as well. Uh, so there's a, that, that's a double-edged sword, but, but the, the, the primary edge of that sort is, is a relatively resilient U.S. economy. It, in my assessment, uh, and in the assessment of a lot of economists, probably uh, more than not, the U.S. might avoid a recession. 
that's counter, counter to my initial view, which would that it would be very difficult. We'll see uh, just how high and how fast rates have to go. Uh, China, of course, has had a, a, a further stumble in, uh, in the second quarter and then into the third quarter on the back of ongoing lockdowns uh, and ongoing uh, problems in particular in the real estate sector. Uh, but the underlying dynamism of the Chinese economy remains quite strong. Uh, so I would uh, continue to hope that uh, when we get through this COVID period, uh, perhaps punctuated by the, the party Congress in, uh, in October, that we would see a return to, uh, to the kind of growth that could help to pull the, uh, the global economy out of recession. And of course, the, the most immediate impact would be right here. So yeah, as it's possible that we've misassessed and that it could be a little bit worse. It's, I think it's also possible that it could be a, a little bit less bad, let's say. Uh, I can tell you from, from Standard Charter's perspective uh, that the focus that we're bringing to this is to continue to invest in our business globally and in particular in this region uh, with the view that the medium to long term is positive in any case, uh, even if we have some, some additional bumps along the road. But of course, we, we look and we watch and we reassess and, and, and uh, course correct as necessary. But, but broadly, I would say uh, we think that the recovery, the post-COVID recovery is still on track. I'm just wondering because a Belgian minister said that um, the energy crisis in Europe could last for 10 winters. It'll be 10 difficult winters. So it could be longer than most of us are expecting. Yeah, like the energy crisis in Europe is tragic, absolutely tragic. And you know, I, I was in Germany before beating this trip. Uh, the air conditioning was turned off in my hotel in August with 38 degrees outside. And that's, those are the kinds of steps. No, that's, that's not hardship. Uh, relative to what's happening in Ukraine right now, let's be clear. Uh, but that's, uh, you know, these are the actions, and that's the summertime. The wintertime, is, it's going to be very, very difficult. Europe will absolutely be in recession. Uh, ten winters, I seriously doubt it. I, I think the, the resilience of supply chains that we've seen, apart from the energy sector, is, is quite strong. Uh, the, 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 the stakes for getting it right for energy producers around the world, so whether it's delivering the LNG terminals, readjusting, the, uh, the, the, the acceptability of, of nuclear power, uh, dare I say it, the acceptability of coal-fired power, uh, which, will, which will, I think, shave the peaks in the, in the short term. But will there be a dislocation in the European energy markets for 10 years? Yeah, of course, because there's 10 wasted years depending on Russian gas, which will, which will be seen with the benefit of hindsight as one of the geopolitical tragic mistakes of this decade, but it, it, or this millennium, possibly. Uh, but it's happened. And, and, but you know, we'll recover. Before we touch on the uh, opportunities in Southeast Asia, I'd just like to touch very quickly on the impact of the king dollar, the strong dollar, 20-year highs. When it comes to the ringgit, it is uh, at the lowest level since the Asian financial crisis, if I'm not wrong. Mm. Uh, Minister Zafrul, how are you ensuring stability of the ringgit mm -hmm. and stability of the financial sector? Well, the stability of the financial sector in Malaysia, yeah, it's still there. I mean, we look at where we are on the bank. Central Bank has announced uh, the slightly tightening of our monetary policy. Uh, rates has gone up, as I mentioned just now, 25 basis points. So in this year alone, it's gone up by 75 basis points. The, the plan is to, you know, from what the central bank has said, is to do increase gradually, right? Uh, because we do not want to... Obviously, there's a side effect uh, to increasing rates uh, too aggressively to the economy, right? Um, and what we've seen is um, our economy is growing strongly. Um, as I said, first half of the year is already 6.9%. So we can afford to increase the, rate, the rates. And on dollars, of course, um, as you said, uh, dollars has strengthened against all currencies. If you look at Malaysian ringgit, Malaysian ringgit is actually, you know, just like uh, uh, Indonesian rupiah, who's also done very well relative to other uh, currencies. But if you compare it with dollars, of course not. So if you look at Malaysian ringgit, it's actually strengthened against uh, pound sterling, it's strengthened against euro, it's strengthened against Korean won. Japanese but the yen. risk is to the downside. The Fed has moved 225 basis points, mm -hmm. but Bank Nagara has moved 75. The yeah. risk is that the currency will be under pressure. No, because you have to understand what is the inflation rate in US, right? So right. You, don't, you don't have the monetary tools that are available in Malaysia or in other markets for that matter. Also depends on the economic scenario in that particular country. So as I mentioned earlier, the inflation rate is in Malaysia in the first six months or first seven months in this case is 2.8%. So we can continue to have an accommodative monetary policy and which is supported by a very, uh, fisc very large fiscal support. Right? Our uh, subsidy, for example, is the highest ever uh, at close to $20 billion. So that also has helped. So we 
through the um, application of uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy in Malaysia, we continue to support. But what's important is, at the end of the day, the, the day is about the mid-term and long-term uh, prospect of the economy. So if the economy or the fundamental of the economy remains strong, we should not be too fixated just on the performance of our currency versus one particular We'll try currency. not to be fixated. Minister Sri Mulani, I mean, taking a look at the rupiah, inching ever closer to 15,000, Standard Chartered says 15,000 by the end of the third quarter. Do you think the level of the rupiah right now reflects its fundamentals? What's fair value? Well, Indonesia has the regime which is managed floating uh, in a way that it should reflect the fundamental. As I said, that we have 27 months surplus on a trade account, and our uh, reserve uh, also is actually uh, now uh, in a record high. We also see the FDIs coming to Indonesia despite uh, the very strong dollars. Of course, some like the bonds holder uh, of the government bonds, they are actually releasing the ownership. But uh, stock uh, isn't even in this case, stock is still actually receiving the capital inflow. And I also see just uh, recently that the demand for our government bonds is so increased on the FDI because we are reforming very deep uh, structurally on the ease of doing business. We have passed the omnibus law for the job creation. We uh, strengthening and simplify the investment procedure. We also provide strong uh, incentive for the downstreaming industries, especially natural resource base. Uh, so we also develop the electric vehicle as well as battery, and that is attracting co uh, quite robust the FDI that support what we call it the external balance. So in a way, Indonesia can see that the dollar strengthened because of the policy of the Federal Reserve cannot be avoided, but we can increase our resiliency, which is not uh, vulnerable as vulnerable as when we have the taper tantrum in 2013 because of the current account, uh, which is now becoming surplus, as well as trade account, and our budget is also very, very prudent. I'm going to the deficit of 2.85%, which is currently discussed for next year. This is a very fast and robust, credible budget consolidation only within three years. Uh, and that's providing a very strong fond foundation for the macroeconomic, as well as our structural. Is there a need, you think, for Governor Wajio to, I guess, tighten further? Some say that perhaps he would need to tighten even before that September meeting. Well, first, uh, we have to look at, again, the anatomy of uh, the inflation. I think we are all agree, uh, government as well as central bank working hand in hand in order for us to be able to understand if the inflation is really coming from the supply side, then the government working very closely regarding uh, what is the source of this uh, increasing price. If this is food or energy, then we have to find out how we are going to overcome that. That means that we are going to provide also room for the monetary authority to, of course, decide independently and credibly regarding where the position of their monetary policy. We don't want to use excessive, in this case, policy instrument like interest rate that can kill the whole monetary uh, uh, um, uh, recovery of the economy. But that is really up to the central bank to do that. And that's why they decide if this inflation is going to affect, the current inflation is going to affect the expectation of the inflation in a more permanent basis, then it is time for the central bank to act. So within that context, we will work so that we are going to use this policy as appropriate as possible without overkilling or creating what you call it unintended consequences rather than stability of the price itself. So we will look at very detail on the demand side, what is the factor, Bank Indonesia is using macroprudential uh, policy mix. It is not only interest rate, but they also using reserve uh, requirement. They also have the macroprudential. I think these are all going to match very uh, uh, hand in hand with the government own effort to try to stabilize price, especially which is coming from the supply disruption side. Bill, fundamentals in Southeast Asia seem intact. I mean. There's no doubt about that. When we talk about capitalizing on the opportunities and the strengths of the region, I mean, how is Standard Chartered positioning itself? 
As, as Ben mentioned at the outset, uh, we, we start by having a, a, a very meaningful presence in every ASEAN country, uh, and in most cases for over a century. And uh, combine that with, with a strong business in, in greater China, so connecting through that, that critically important trade corridor, and then through to the US and Europe, uh, that other critically important uh, pair of trade corridors. So the, the, the way that we're, we're positioning ourselves, and of course the, the ASEAN region is quite diverse itself, and uh, disparate in terms of economic development, although the underlying growth story is, is quite impressive across uh, the region. So we have a, a, a good, strong local business on the ground. Uh, we have a, a strong business to focus on the, the, the really substantial flow of international investment into the region, uh, not least from China, uh, although of course it's not limited to China by any means, uh, and to uh, capture the, the external trading opportunities for, uh, for our, our corporate clients uh, who are local in the various ASEAN markets. And that, the, that, that uh, sort of circular approach uh, has stood us in very good stead so far, and I think we'll, we'll continue to. Uh, so it's, it's, for us, it's a matter of, of making sure that we've got the, the, the right resources on the ground and then the right connectivity to the rest of our network. Uh, to do that at, at a time of extraordinary volatility uh, means that, of course, we would need to have the, the, uh, the, the hedging and, and trading facilities in place and associated uh, credit facilities in place to, to help all of our clients to, to smooth through the ups and downs of uh, what we know is going to be a bumpy road ahead. But <clears throat> I, I, we didn't write this script uh, in terms of the, either the geopolitical or the global economic uh, outplay, but uh, I must say it, it, uh, it plays to all of our strengths, uh, not because we want to capitalize on, on the problems of the world, but, but, but we are in a position to help solve, or at least assist with some of those problems, and that's exactly what I and my colleagues have set about to do. As we talk about recovery and resilience, we have to talk about green transition. It is about mobilizing uh, in that vein, mobilizing uh, private capital. Where, how do you see PPP playing out in this area? Well, it is important. I mean, partly to do with what we're seeing in the economy today as well. Um, but the, the, the key is for, for us in government, apart from fiscal intervention, what we can also do to assist is to ensure that the transition happens. Uh, um, we've seen how many uh, companies need assistance from the government uh, when they transition from uh, to, towards a more greener or towards more ESG uh, uh, compliance uh, business practices. So for Malaysia, what we're doing uh, today um, is obviously, uh, first, we need to ensure uh, that we have the right ecosystem in place, the right policy in place. So the policy uh, is being finalized. Uh, the, ministry, the relevant ministry will be announcing it. And through the financial markets, we are going to launch the voluntary carbon market, for example, and that will be done by our stock exchange sometime by the before end of this year. Um, the, finally, I think on the fiscal incentives, uh, the government uh, working closely uh, with the industries because this is, requires a whole of nation, a whole of society approach uh, towards achieving where we want to achieve uh, by 2050. And mm. Minister Shimuliani, of course, EV has a huge place in Indonesia. Indonesia has a huge EV ambition. Uh, um, and your president discussed that with my editor-in-chief just recently. I'm just wondering, I mean, what's the plan there? Because uh, there's a skills gap that needs to be addressed. There are other issues, not to mention investments that are needed for that to, to be realized. Well, first, uh, align with so many objectives that we would like to achieve. Climate change is for sure, and Indonesia is committed to reduce our CO2 uh, emission by 29% with our own effort and 41% with the international support. And that will require quite a lot of transition of our energy. Energy, in this case in Indonesia, which is still now dominated by the coal uh, energy, then we have to convert it into non uh, 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 to the renewable energy. Now, within that context, I think when we are discussing about uh, how we are going to use this uh, production of the electricity, one which we can see, especially now with the fossil fuel increase uh, very extremely, uh, then we also make sense for people to have the incentive five for electric vehicle, whether this is the motor or motorbike in this case, two wheel or four wheel. I think they are all equally important because Indonesia two wheel EV is now getting more and more popular. Now, uh, that's with Indonesia own in this case uh, market domestic, which is very, very strong. It will also attract quite a lot of what you call it FDI on this area both on the electric vehicle as well as the battery uh, electric vehicle supply chains, which is, I think, equally very strong. 
If you talk about what is the ecosystem of this investment is already being prepared. First, we've already now uh, built so many, what you call it, infrastructure, whether this is road, uh, railways, uh, port, which is all connected to the industrial area. So that definitely addressing the issue of whether we have the right infrastructure for actually attracting FDI. Second, you talk about the human capital. Of course, Indonesia now upgrading many of the vocational training. We are going to be very pragmatic so the industry can train directly. And I provide, in this case, fiscal incentive. They can even, in this case, claim their training uh, spending. Uh, double deduction for their uh, 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 their their spending for the tax. That's also including for the research and development. And Indonesia have quite a lot of good university in which they are going to be able to produce this kind uh, of uh, labor force. So I think what you're just saying that if we look at and diagnose thing, uh, diagnose the environment or the ecosystem of this investment, we recognize. Indonesia is not yet everything is solved, but government systematically and consistently addressing all those issues. And after five years, President Jokowi now, or of course, interrupted by this pandemic, but I think we can see that the interest for investment in Indonesia, especially for the electric vehicle, as well as the battery, is actually very, very strong. And this is also supported by our natural resources because Indonesia has the biggest nickel production in the world and all uh, other cobalt. So we actually have uh, an, uh, in a very good position to actually capitalizing this trend. When can we expect your nickel tax? <laughs> I know it is by this year, but uh, could it be maybe this month, next month? Well, the policy is more downstreaming uh, industry, so it is not about the tax. Uh, how you are going to use whether this is the, uh, is going to be the excise uh, or the export duty, or in in this case, uh, not allowing or disbanding export of nickel. These are all adjusted to the objective of developing industries, manufacturing industry, which is related to processing nickel. And at the very end, it's going to be the product on both vehicle, whether this is uh, two wheels or four wheels. As Bill mentioned earlier, I think I just uh, also know that European in a very difficult position now with the energy and others. So we are actually now become a very attractive place for you to invest because uh, market in ASEAN is very big, Indonesia itself is also providing a very strong domestic market support. The reform uh, on our policy, investment policy and trade policy has been very progressive. We also simplifying so many uh, regulation and we also investing in infrastructure and human capital. So these are all the necessary condition for the investment uh, to happen in Indonesia. So as again, the policy related to the nickel, whether this is a tax, export, or industrialization, is going to be a one concerted effort in order to make Indonesia to be a place to invest. Bill, from a business perspective, what's stopping Southeast Asia from realizing its full potential? Uh, Southeast Asia, obviously, is a, it is a disparate region, and uh, I think one thing that, uh, that, that I know the ASEAN nations are continuing to focus on is economic integration across the region. And uh, while we can all look at the, the, the ASEAN construct and see tremendous benefit to be had from, uh, from, from trading arrangements, currency arrangements, uh, it's not fully there. So uh, I would encourage further, uh, further steps in that direction. I think creating a stronger regional markets, in, in particular, we, we, we were asking uh, the ministers before about the sustainability. Uh, the, the sustainable finance market uh, in this region is huge. Uh, I, I would like to particularly praise uh, actually both ministers, but in particular Sri Liani during this uh, period where Indonesia is hosting the G20 uh, and the associated B20. There is some fantastic stuff going on, and there's a, a strong
strong public-private partnership that uh, that I think could set new uh, new models for development. Uh, you know, let's roll those out first in ASEAN and 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 see if we can't make ASEAN a a, a, a truly global hub for sustainable finance, for carbon markets, uh, for for the way things can be done in the most constructive way. I think the foundations are being very well laid. So. Uh, always more to do, but I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to reflect on the progress that, that we've made with ASEAN over the past uh, years and decades uh, to get us to this place. All right. On that note, we'd like to thank, because it's time is already blinking red, <laughs> Minister Shimulani Dawati, thank you so much for your time today. Of course, uh, Minister Zafro and Bill Winters, thank you for your insights. Please welcome to the stage. Ng Lai Yi, Singapore Managing Partner and Country Leader at IBM Consulting. Deborah Elms, CEO of Asian Trade Center. And Ambassador Sihasek Fongket Giao, Special Advisor of the Eastern Economic Corridor, former Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Thailand. For a conversation with Bloomberg's Michelle Jamrisco. Three fantastic, fantastic panelists, a lot to discuss, and as always, we're short on time, so I'll try to get right to it here. Um, over the past couple of years, we've talked a lot about the wild swings in supply chains, many of them negative. <laughs> we've talked about the cliches of, uh, you know, just in case over just in time of supply chain resilience. So today, I'd like to move that conversation a little bit further, talk about more of the upside of that conversation, the value chains, and what ASEAN economies are doing to move up the value chains and to kind of find those opportunities out of crisis. So at first, let's just set the scene. For supply chains, I, I want to know from each of you, do you see us as coming out of the COVID phase, or are we still dealing with so many of the problems of the past two years still, plus lingering problems from the Ukraine war and those effects on, on supply chains themselves. Ambassador, do you want to start? Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to be here. I think from the last session, the speakers, most of them noted that um, most of the countries in the region are in the process of economic recovery. But uh, of course, uh, the, the external environment you know, doesn't offer cause for optimism. I don't have to list out all of them. But, but I, you know, I, I think when I, I see it this way, that uh, this crisis and recovery really is an opportunity for each of the ASEAN countries to do what we haven't done for a long time, which is economic restructuring. And so when I talk about recovery, I think we have to think long term. And uh, for, for, for Thailand, of course, we face this problem of the middle income trap. We've been stuck for a decade. And so the challenge is to restructure our economy to make it more competitive in line with the, the global economy and trends, and also to move ourselves up the, the global value chain. And this is what uh, you know, we are doing in the place where I'm working, which is the Eastern Economic Corridor. Um, it's the three provinces uh, to the east of Bangkok, immediate east of Bangkok. And here, of course, we're going towards more advanced technology. Second, we're developing infrastructure, airports, high-speed train, expanding our ports, and our logistics, and also investing a lot in what we haven't done before, which is human capital, mm. and going towards a digital economy, because these days, you know, everything is about digitalization. And the big challenge also is how to seize this opportunity of this transition to do more in terms of sustainability. I, I think you know it offers both it's a challenge and opportunities for, for new investment. And I think these days investors, when they look at places to invest, they think uh, about you know what kind of uh, environment does that country offer in terms in terms of sustainability, green economy. So these things that we are doing uh, in terms of our efforts to move up 
the value chain. But I think, you know, I, I've been a diplomat most of my life. I'm not an economist. I've never been in business. But I am a believer in the region. I am a believer in ASEAN. And of course, ASEAN is facing tremendous challenges these days to what we call our centrality. But, but I think that there's a lot of potential in the region. And we look at it uh, in terms of the facts and figures. Uh, I think inter-ASEAN trade has increased. Intra-ASEAN investment has increased. And, uh, and also, you know, we have uh, the RCEP, ASEP, which may not be so much in terms of trade and free trade, but I think it's going to help in terms of enhancing the investment flows in the region and especially the, the harmonization of the rules of origin. And so I, I think we will see, and I hope that uh, with this process of integration that we can try to push forward more is more diversification and uh, regionalization of the supply chain. And, but to, to be able to seize that opportunity, it's up to all of us to position ourselves to, to, you know, to seize the opportunities that's come, that are coming with the diversification of supply chain and, uh, and the risk that we face externally. So I hope that it's not just each country, but also the region working together. Certainly, and you mentioned digital a few times. That is something that we do want to get a little bit more into. But first, Deb Laie, what do you see when you're looking at the supply chain world that we're in now? <laughs> well, I like the ambassador's comments, and I think certainly there's a lot of opportunity in ASEAN, but I would really love to see the region seize this opportunity and do something with it. You know, we've had decades of integration in ASEAN. There are so many plans, so many activities, so many work plans, so many pilot projects and all, I mean, I could go on and on, and most of them don't get implemented. So we don't need new thought, really. <laughs> we have ample thought. We need to actually implement stuff in ASEAN. You know, we have seven, just as an example, we have at least seven different ASEAN highway initiatives, like to link up the countries of ASEAN by road, and as far as I know, you still can't drive across ASEAN. So, like, what are we doing? Why would we make us an eighth version of this plan? We have seven of them. Like, just do one and get it done and then move on to something else. So it would be great if ASEAN would seize the opportunity caused by this crisis to actually implement something. I think that would be awesome. Because the disruption that we've had is intense. Uh, it's significant. It's particularly hit ASEAN hard, as many of you, of course, know, because of the reliance on travel and tourism, which is shattered, <laughs> the problems we've had with mobility, um, the inconsistent responses that we've had, the reliance of this region on places where COVID is still happening, well, at least where we still pretend that it's happening. We don't seem to be pretending that it's happening here, which is great, personally, but you know, other places that are worried about COVID. So I think it's, 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 we're not out of the woods yet for ASEAN recovery and supply chains. Uh, but it would be awesome if these governments in this region, together with their dialogue partners, and I think you mentioned the importance of ASEAN with other kinds of groups, mm -hmm. entities, agencies, NGOs, international organizations, businesses, business organizations. I mean, the infrastructure is amazing to try to support ASEAN through, through disruption, but I think it's now time to turn to actually implementing some stuff. Let's get it done, let's move on, you know? So that would be awesome if we could actually deliver that. And, and I, my last sort of point before I, I turn it over to the rest of my panel, you know, I think we've had some interesting initiatives this year out of Cambodia as ASEAN chair. Cambodia is, I think, a bit more ambitious than people might imagine, given its developmental status. They've been trying very hard to actually deliver things, including in the digital space. But, you know, ASEAN loves shiny stuff. So they like the next most exciting something or other, and you know, the instinct to just turn and go to something else new and exciting 
is tough. It's tough for a Cambodia. It's tough for next year. Uh, Indonesian chair will be tough as well. So if we could keep, especially from the business community, my plea, I'm assuming most of you are business, plea from the business community is to please make sure that you are communicating as regularly as possible with ASEAN officials to say, make it happen. That's what matters to us. Make whatever you promised actually happen. And that would make a big difference to us in our business activities every day and in the way in which our supply chains are actually resilient and then in which we could move up the value chain. So let me just stop there. Thanks. Don't get distracted by the shiny stuff. No shiny yeah. stuff. <laughs> I think echoing to what Deborah mentioned, I think the pandemic has certainly pushed us forward to have maybe clearer perspective of why we need to move up the chain and what are some of the uh, supply chain executives are looking for, right? Uh, in one of the study that IBM did, uh, they are saying that with this pandemic and many of the unseen uh, geopolitical situations, it's actually led people to think that, you know, we're not only going to be just reliable, Right? Uh, the just-in-time doctrine might not uh, be as relevant now. How do we become, we've heard things on uh, being resilient. Now, what does being resilient mean? Right? I think there are a lot of asks to say that can supply chain be more transparent, be more visible? Can they allow you know, embracing the data and insights that we have across the very disparate supply chain uh, functions? Can we look across that? Uh, to see whether we can uh, uh, come up with different risk, model, risk models, alternate supplier chains, uh, uh, simulations. I think all of that, if, if, you, if, if we can pull that together and get that done, I think we have a lot that we can achieve uh, in ASEAN. And I think with that, uh, I'm going to say technology is going to play a big part. I'm sure, Michelle, uh, we, we've talked about that mm -hmm. uh, as we discussed as well. I, I truly believe that this is the time where we need to embrace technology in supply chain in order to achieve uh, what we've been saying and what Deborah says, Let, let's get going and get it done. Yeah, well, certainly I want to hone in on the digitalization aspect of this. Um, you know, to borrow another COVID-era cliche, we're all emerging stronger, right? Or at least hoping to. And digital has been such a big message out of so many ASEAN economies, if not all of them. Um, first, I do want to bring up the audience uh, participation polling question, uh, if we could. It's a slightly off topic, but I do want to get that in so then we can uh, talk about that and then move into digitalization. Uh, but one thing that we've heard a lot in the news, uh, at least in the trade world, is the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Of course, we had a meeting of 14 uh, delegations in Los Angeles last week. Uh, the polling question, if we can bring it up, is about how your, the audience feels about what benefit if, or lack of benefit there might be uh, to this framework. So if you could <laughs> select one of the three options, uh, and then we'll tackle that in a second. But in the meantime, let me post to the panels on digitalization, uh, if we can kind of move in two directions at once. Uh, you know, how would you grade governments and business in ASEAN on, you know, as you say, Deb, you know, maybe there's a lot of talk and, and less walk right now, but on digital, on digital initiatives coming out of the pandemic, how are we doing? <laughs> where, where are we in getting some of that stuff done versus just talking about emerging stronger and what a great idea it would be to transform everything into the tech world? I think it's a mixed picture. So we have some governments that have done a really good job, I think, of being supportive of the move to digital. And particularly where you need to focus in ASEAN is on the smaller, smaller businesses. So getting your SMEs to go digital is uh, an area that I think a lot of governments have done a good job of investing in. So as an example here in Singapore, they've you know, moved tens of thousands of hawkers at the hawker centers into the digital economy by trying to cajole them to please give up cash and accept digital payments or to work with digital delivery companies for food. I think that's been very impressive. And you see stories like that across the region. I think the other thing that gives me optimism in the digital space is that ASEAN governments have actually done a really good job, in my view, of thinking about what does a digital framework look like that could be connected between all of them. So they signed a digital economy, a, 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 e they call it an e-commerce agreement, in 2018, which is, you know, yay. Uh, and then they have a work plan attached to this, which we spent a year actually developing the work plan, so I can tell you it's an awesome document. Uh, and we, uh, the best part about actually developing that work plan was the interaction with ASEAN members. So we had incredible, which is the thing that gives me optimism, incredible participation from all 10 ASEAN countries. 
at the domestic level. They were bringing in not just their trade ministries, but across their government, their digital economy ministries, even agriculture was there, customs, trade facilities, so a huge intergovernmental effort to figure out what is it that we agreed to do, how can we do that domestically, and then within all of ASEAN's very complicated structure, all kinds of sectoral bodies also engaged. So we had crazy involvement from all these committees that work across ASEAN, and at the end of it, made a work plan that everybody agreed to, which is, I think, amazing, right? That doesn't happen very often in ASEAN. All of that is great, but as so often in ASEAN, we haven't implemented it. So <laughs> let's hope that there are some projects, and there are some that are getting picked up, and one of the things that's in there, in case you're interested in digital and you want to take my advice and talk to government, in 2023, which is already next year, we have a review of that work plan. So you could, if you want, ask your local government official, where are we on the implementation and the review of that work plan of the digital economy, and then we could actually implement some stuff that would make a difference. So there are ways that you can, that business especially, can push ASEAN to deliver more, because I think the enthusiasm is there. It's just that you have a thousand priorities, and then which one do you focus on is difficult. But I do think ASEAN at the moment is putting digital not just because it's a shiny thing, but because it actually matters. And I think that's, that's something that's fantastic that should be seized upon. Yeah. So ahead of implementation of a lot of these big initiatives, Lai, what's your <laughs> view from your yeah. perch at IBM? Are businesses moving much faster? Yes. I think, you know, while we would like governments to play a bigger part in pushing these big projects, I think what's important is businesses need to really take charge and move forward with some of these projects to show the quick wins, right? Um, and two key areas that we're seeing a lot, in, in fact, in our survey, uh, uh, more than 40% are already looking at AI, deep tech, AI data going on cloud uh, to implement cognitive control towers, right? Really a connected hub looking at data that integrates as I've mentioned earlier, the disparate uh, supply chains so that it can give them better information, right? Help them with risk modeling uh, to make uh, uh, decisions or to ensure they do not over or under react on any uh, uh, economic situation. Uh, the other key projects that we are also seeing, in fact, more than 20% of uh, uh, supply chain executives are talking about a digital twins, right? The digital twin where you can simulate. So the, the, the control towers give you the information to take uh, decisions, to, to uh, make better decisions, but now they're talking about digital twins, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to see how can I simulate, and I think that's absolutely critical because we don't know what the next pandemic, economic situation, what prices are going to be. I think the earlier panel talked about perhaps a misjudgment on oil prices or, or inflation and all. How do we then uh, uh, ensure that we've got the tools and the technology to help us when such situations occur, because I don't think we can predict perfectly, but when it occurs, how can then uh, be able to react correctly, mm. uh, minimize misinformation, in, in and minimize the impact, negative impact? I don't think we can, you know, we will get away from it, but how do we minimize it? I think it's where I'm hoping the businesses will take charge, and I think with that, encourage us at the nation level, encourage SMEs. Uh, and then, of course, encouraging governments to come in and facilitate an ecosystem of platforms uh, where we can help ASEAN as a whole. Mm. Well, you mentioned cloud somewhere in there, and I wanted to specifically direct that to Ambassador, uh, to you. Your deputy PM recently mentioned that big companies are looking to invest in cloud computing in Thailand, specifically in areas like the Eastern Economic Corridor. Can you tell me, you know, how is that going? What, what is your pitch to these investors, and, and what is the ambition right now? I mean, what, what kinds of investors and what kind of volumes are you seeing bringing in? Well, of course, um, we realize the importance of uh, the digital economy. And uh, for me, it's um, whether we're going to be successful or not is um, we need partnership between the government and the private sector. And this has always been our approach as far as the EEC is concerned, especially in the development of infrastructure, the airport, and the high-speed train, for instance. And, and it's the same with the digital economy. And so, you know, we, our task, we call ourselves a sandbox. Our task is to really provide the right regulations, mm. the right regulatory framework, so that the private sector will have incentives 
to invest uh, in, in cloud computing in Thailand. And I think uh, we are offering a good package. But in the EEC, if I could just talk a little bit about it. Our approach is not just providing blanket incentives. Our approach is to look at the individual companies and to negotiate and to discuss and have what we call customized incentives. And so each company prob probably have different sets of requirements. And, but of course, it has to be to the mutual interests of both sides. But, but on cloud computing, yes, indeed, uh, we're doing a lot and we're talking uh, with AWS, Google, and uh, Control S, and uh, another company whose name I forgot. But anyway, mm -hmm. well, we are you know, trying to, and we've set up uh, what we call the digital hub. Now in the EC, we have, of course, uh, introduced the 5G network but we're going beyond that and we have a digital hub and we're trying to promote R&D in the digital economy and to create the right regulatory environment and also the right the place that uh, you can invest in, in, in the digital services. So if you build it, they will come, huh? to borrow a movie quote. Huh? Well, we have <laughs> to provide the, you know, the framework, the, the place and the environment. Okay. Okay, let's bring up the polling uh, results. Uh, let me see if we can check out how people voted. Okay, and I should have my glasses on, but it looks like the, the final option, it's an empty framework with ASEAN being used as a pawn in, a, in the counter China uh, US strategy. So a, a fairly pessimistic view uh, from the audience about the use of IPEF for, for ASEAN. Does that match? Does anybody want to comment on the, the result there? Does it surprise you? Do you agree, disagree? Well, could I? Please. Because, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we didn't have Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. We had Asia-Pacific. So Indo-Pacific is, in a way, a geostrategic construct, which I think um, is good because it reflects the rise of India the engagement of India. But I'm a little bit concerned now that, you know, the, the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy has placed emphasis on, the, on containing China, deterring China. But it, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, we want to see, you know, a balance of power in the region. We want to see the United States engage. We have to live with China, of course. <laughs> China is a major power in the region. But what, what we want, hopefully, at, at a certain stage, both countries working together to meet the needs of the region. Because right now, it's a competition between the two major powers. But we, we don't really want to be caught in this geopolitical contestation, but it's an unavoidable. But the economic agenda that the United States is pushing under the framework, the Indo-Pacific, Economic. It's good. It's good, but I, I hope that you know the U.S. would add more substance to it, and uh, you know meet. You know we want to see more trade. <laughs> we want to see mm -hmm. more development cooperation. Market uh, access. Yeah. So, so th these are issues that we hope that. Well, first, this initiative is good. <laughs> it's a positive agenda being pursued by the United States in the context of Indo-Pacific, and uh, but I hope that they would flesh out. Uh, the, this initiative with more substance and also listen to the needs of countries in the region. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on glass half full, glass half empty here on the IPEF? Well, I would just note that one of the pillars in IPEF is on supply chains. Mm. And the, the ministers who just met said that they're all enthusiastic about resilient, open, and inclusive supply chains. So they're going to work towards that, which, I mean, I suppose that's great, but again, for me, I don't know, has anyone ever asked for not resilient, like weak, ineffective, <laughs> not, not integrated supply chains? I don't not think anyone ever tag. really <laughs> said that. So I, I'm assuming that this is the direction we all agree we need to go, but then as always, what does that mean about how we're gonna get there? And so the real challenge on IPEF, uh, the Pacific Economic Framework, is how, how do you take those very broad, very enthusiastic kinds of you know, motherhood and apple pie statements and translate them down into 
especially for business, sort of actionable things that make a difference to your jobs between now and let's say, you know, whatever, five years from now or less. I mean, obviously you would prefer next quarter. That is not gonna happen. So sometime in the, you know, relatively near term before we are all dead, can we please get some kind of results from IPATH? And I, maybe we will. You know, it's, it, I think that it's a, it's a framework that allows you to do a lot of different things with it. And so, you know, I suppose if we're all pushing in the same general direction and we all agree on the same general goals, maybe that's how you get a more interesting uh, outcome from this. So I think there's still, there's st I think the glass is in the middle and then you make of it what you want to do with that. It could be fantastic. It could be a complete waste of time. And it, it depends on, in a way on all of us and our enthusiasm in, in promoting or pushing these kinds of ideas, whether we get something useful or we get just a lot of people flying around and talking. Well, we're running up against time, but I do want to ask one final quick question, uh, if, if we can make it quick. Uh, and this, Ambassador, I was thinking about when you mentioned customized incentives. It kind of reminded me of uh, the announcements that we've heard both out of Singapore and Thailand and others across the world recently about trying to attract global talent, but very specifically, very targeted finding in certain sectors. Uh, you know, and I wanted to ask, Lai, you've, you've talked about talents before and the importance of talent. Uh, in you know, kind of marketing for Southeast Asia economies. I mean, where, where are you seeing those opportunities right now? How would you grade ASEAN on, on doing that? And is this an exciting time where we might see more of that uh, to come? Yeah, I think I was going to also add on to what Deborah mentioned about you know it's just a framework coming back to the framework, and we need to get something you know going. So I think what's really important is for businesses to and, and, and leaders, right? All of us are business leaders here to really adopt a different mindset. I think it starts from that. We need to have a mindset, and we need to have an uh, uh, to adopt a more agile way of doing. I know agile is a uh, you know widely overused. You know what does it mean? You know do you get a scrum master and all? But it's not. I think really I really believe it is about a mindset change, right? It is about breaking down a big framework or a big problem into smaller chunks and really get to that quick momentum of implementing something, getting something done. I think that's absolutely uh, uh, critical, right? Um, and uh, so the, the agile way of doing the mindset change, then comes the talent, because what I've, we've been talking about, there's gonna be a lot of digitalization. I think in five years time, I think similar to in the finance sector or in the technology sector, people talk about lack of skills in the deep tech. I think we're going to have the same challenge here in ASEAN if we don't do something today. And I know that the governments have put in a lot of incentives and, and help in that area. Uh, I think it is time for all, all of us to embrace a different mindset, to have a more agile way of doing, to embrace the talent. I think we have a lot of potential here. We've got a lot of support. Uh, it's really important for all of us to work together as an ASEAN to embrace that. I like agility it seems to be a good watchword to, to focus on in the months ahead. Well, thank you so much to all of you. Unfortunately, we're, we're seeing the flashing red, so we, we could con continue this for hours, but hopefully we can continue the conversation uh, after this panel ends. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Please take your seats. The program will begin in five minutes. Please take your seats. Our program will now begin. Please welcome the Honorable Mohammed Atik Islam, Mayor of Dhaka North, Bangladesh. Angelia Chin Sharp, Singapore CEO of BNP Paribas Asset Management, and Sonali Tang, Asian Development Bank Regional Director, Singapore, for a conversation with Bloomberg's Ishika Mukherjee. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we're here to talk about Southeast Asia and how the green recovery is really working in the region. Um, Southeast Asia has come out with a target of having 23% of its primary energy needs met by renewable sources by 2025. So I'm here to chat with our panelists about how far along we are in that journey, who's financing it really, and what are the key hurdles that the region is facing in terms of climate change and access to funding. 
Um, so if we can start with Mayor Islam, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, could you tell us a bit more about how pressing the problem of climate change is for Bangladesh and what Dhaka in particular uh, is facing in terms of impact? Thank you very much uh, to arranging such a uh, event about the climate change and other challenges. Uh, as a local economic expand and development strategy to the mitigate climate change, cities will continue to play an important role in their supporting national and regional governments in and meeting their climate targets. And the world will not stay on 1.5 degree centigrade trajectory without the decarbonizing energy demand. Dhaka is also itself a highly vulnerable to climate hazard, especially flooding and heat that have served cascading effects on people's health, those who come to our cities seeking safety and better livelihood often find themselves trading one set of bricks for another. In my country, the I'm just giving an example, unical impact and, uh, that the, every day around two, uh, 2,000 people are coming from different part of my uh, different district due to, as I mentioned many times, that the sea level is going up the agriculture, agricultural land is now under the saline water. So the coastal areas, the, uh, uh, the, in the coastal areas, those who are living there, they cannot do anything at this moment. And every day, 2,000 people are coming in my city, Dhaka city. And I cannot say, no, you cannot enter in my city. Being a, a city mayor, I have to invite all of them. So it is a big challenge for my city at this moment. Thank you. Um, thanks for that. How are you really doing sort of urban planning around this big influx of migrants right now? Um, and are you involving green finance in any way? Are you building renewable energy sources to meet the power needs of uh, the new population in Dhaka? Yeah, there's a, uh, there's, uh, there's a big challenge at this moment. There's a big challenge at this moment. We must have to the renewable energy. Without the renewable energy, we cannot make the uh, net zero and uh, what is our goal for the climate change as well. So very recently from Dhaka North City Corporation, uh, we are going to about 42.5 megawatt from waste to energy. Uh, we just uh, going to uh, taking. Uh, we just going to start that one. It's very challenging, as because all my city, especially in Dhaka city, we cannot do the separation of our waste uh, because there is a slum areas. The slum areas they don't do the segregation. Right. There is a lot of areas which is under uh, still is not developed. They cannot do the segregation. Mm -hmm. So it's a big challenge. So I, I took a project uh, for the renewable energy, and that is 42.5 megawatt. And of course, uh, Dhaka is, a, uh, Dhaka is a, such a, uh, I mean, the high density country, a city, around 49,000 people are living per square kilometer. 49,000. And when they are leaving my city, they are used my canals. The canals are polluted. They are, uh, there is a, a huge demand of the uh, develop their sanitation is a, another challenge. Mm -hmm. So I urge uh, to the International Development Fund also to come and sit and you can see the reality, what's going on. And I need the justice also for the climate change. A uh, few days back, in the southern part of Bangladesh, you can see the, the name of the Silet district. All of a sudden, around uh, 400,000 people are underwater all of a sudden. And when this kind of 
kind of, I mean, and you know, the climate change effect are in different part of Bangladesh. Ultimately, they are trying to come my city. So yeah. I will say, yes, the renewable energy, the solar energy. Uh, I, I, I urge to all of you, please come to Bangladesh, sit with me, whether we can introduce the solar energy also, while we can, because there's a, in solar energy, there's a one uh, huge challenges is the land. Land right. is not, yep. the land is mm -hmm. not that much in my city, mm -hmm. but of course the canals, the shore of the canals, if you can do that kind of highly a technical solution, then I can use the solar panel on the shore of my, on the shore of my canals. So like this way, we can mitigate this kind of solution. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Islam. Um, perhaps, Sonali, if you can weigh in on what renewable energy sources at this point are, is the ADB really financing and where is assistance needed the most and how much is the region really making progress towards that 23% target? Sure, so let me start by introducing myself. Uh, I'm Sonali Tang, I'm from the Asian Development Bank and I'm the regional director and head of the office in Singapore. Um, I think most of you here know ADB, so I won't go into too many details, uh, but we are Asia's multilateral development bank. We're based in uh, Manila, our head office is Manila, and we're owned by 68 member countries, um, the United States, Japan, uh, China and India being the largest shareholders. Um, ADB's operations span um, a range of uh, needs from our developing member countries. Uh, we cover sovereign financing, so financing to governments and to sovereign agencies, to the private sector increasingly, and we also provide a range of technical assistance and capacity uh, building solutions for our DMCs. Um, as Mayor Islam mentioned, uh, climate change affects all of us. And even though this uh, conference is about ASEAN, you know that uh, climate change is not a problem with any national boundaries. Um, emissions, GHG emissions here in ASEAN affect Bangladesh, they affect India, they affect the, the, the whole world. Um, climate change and its consequences are um, a, a part of uh, ADB's development agenda and a leading part of uh, ADB's development agenda. It's a theme that cuts across all our operations, uh, sovereign, private sector, as well as our knowledge operations. Um, there are a number of different technologies and different solutions, um, and these are, the encouraging thing is that these are being implemented uh, across the region and globally. Um, I think we should take uh, some encouragement from the fact that the momentum has built up in the past two or three years. Um, ADB finances about five to six billion a year via sovereign loans, via loans to the private sector, equity, and a range of different projects. Uh, we do work in Bangladesh uh, quite a lot. Uh, in fact, I did probably the first private sector solar project in Bangladesh um, two years ago. Uh, so there is increasing momentum um, that is building, and uh, in the past two, three years, it has increased even more. So uh, we've been doing five billion a year, but um, ADB's climate ambitions have been increased dramatically. Uh, we hope to be doing 100 billion by 2030, uh, not, not a year, of course, cumulative by 2030. Uh, so there are a number of different areas where we can work with our uh, developing member countries. Mm -hmm. And how far along would you say we are in meeting that 23% target? Um, actually, um, many of the ASEAN countries are very close to or have actually exceeded that target. Mm -hmm. um, the larger, and, and this changes every year. As new renewable energy comes online every year, this uh, tends to change. So countries that are rich in hydro, for example, uh, Laos or the Philippines, they are in excess of 23%. Mm -hmm. Um, other countries, maybe around 20, 21%. Um, renewable energy tends to be very site specific, so it depends on your uh, resources, your um, hydro, uh, uh, solar radiation, wind resources, whether there is enough land to build, as Mayor Islam uh, talked about this. 
uh, also access to technology and materials. Um, so there are a number of different uh, issues that impact how fast or how quickly renewable energy can be um, built up. And uh, but, but the encouraging thing is that it's really ramping up in the last uh, few years, I would say. So I have a statistic here that in the past six years, under 40% of Southeast Asia's new electricity demand was met with clean energy sources, be it solar, wind, or hydropower. So essentially, the growth of fossil fuels is outpacing that of renewables um, in terms of energy generation. Um, what mechanisms are really available right now to these countries for this energy transition? So I think what you mean when you say tra energy transition, you're talking about uh, a number of different things. So it's building up the renewable energy capacity in countries because you know obviously that reduces the reliance on fossil fuel. Um, but we also have to think about uh, some of the existing generation capacity that is fueled by fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a number of different things that ADB is doing in that area. Uh, of course, we continue to finance renewable energy, um, all different types of technologies. Uh, we continue to work on capacity building for new technologies, so hydrogen, storage, etc. cetera. Uh, but then we have two or three uh, innovative mechanisms that are dedicated to transitioning existing fossil fuel. Um, I, I won't have the time to go into uh, the details, but I think most of you have heard about ADB's energy transition mechanism, uh, which is an attempt to decommission uh, coal-fired power earlier than its economic life. Um, we have another facility that we are uh, in the process of structuring now, uh, and that's the Innovative uh, Finance Facility for Climate in Asia Pacific, or IFCAP. Um, and these are all, you know, two, between two and three billion dollar facilities um, each. And these are aimed at uh, transitioning existing fossil fuel as well as new uh, climate investments. Um, we have the ACGF, which is the ASEAN Catalytic Green Facility, and that's a project preparation and design facility. So a number of different areas in which ADB and also other multilaterals are working, uh, because climate agenda is um, a priority for all of us, and it will take all of us to address the consequences. Yeah. Um, Angelia, perhaps coming to you from BNP Paribas Asset Manager's perspective, what are the opportunities right now within this energy transition in Southeast Asia? And I'm, I'm quite interested in knowing how portfolio managers, when they're putting money into these projects, how do they really track outcomes and do the due diligence for their investments? Uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much for having me here. Um, maybe a quick introduction about BNP Paribas Asset Management. Uh, we are a, an asset manage, uh, management company managing uh, assets in excess of uh, 500 over billion euros of assets, and clearly we are the leaders in sustainable investments. Uh, and uh, coming back to your question, uh, Ishika, uh, clearly there's an opportunity, and uh, maybe I'll come back to you know the recent uh, COP26 in terms of ASEAN countries uh, and, and the pledges, pledges that ASEAN countries have made. Uh, all the ASEAN countries are committed in terms of uh, wanting to achieve uh, you know, net zero by 2050 or, or, or earlier. Uh, but then there still remain challenges, uh, and you mentioned about uh, opportunities in terms of capital financing. And it's also interesting if you listen to uh, President Jokowi's uh, speech at COP26 uh, in terms of you know, whether in Indonesia uh, will be able to contribute more quickly uh, to the world's net zero emission. I, I think the biggest uh, question he has raised is also how quick uh, development, uh, developed countries are committed in terms of helping uh, with financing on some of these assistance that is needed. And we all know uh, that a lot of the developed countries have, uh, you know, uh, pledged in terms of at least 100 billion uh, US dollars uh, each year in terms of helping developing countries uh, to, uh, uh, in, in, their, in, in their pathways to transition and achieve the net zero. Uh, but we also know in terms of uh, the commitment, it has fall short, uh, and we've seen that uh, in a number of years. Um, and I think that's where the opportunities come, because as we 
need to achieve the net zero, uh, we also see that there is a lot of capital that is needed. And even though there's a commitment of 100 billion from uh, developed countries, we know that. And as uh, uh, Sonali has said, it's not 100 billion. There's clearly an old trillion of US dollars is needed in terms of building a much more sustainable city. Um, so where we see in terms of opportunities is uh, where uh, there's a commitment uh, in terms of policymakers to do more uh, in terms of building a much more sustainable city within their own countries. Uh, on, on that note, you're going to see a lot of financing needed, uh, whether it be from private or public capital. As asset managers, uh, we see that opportunities as well in terms of channeling capital to these kind of opportunities in terms of coming up with solutions to achieve the net zero agenda. Um, and that's where, where we come in in terms of bridging the gap to bring in the capital because, again, it's a supply and demand story, right? If we see uh, more opportunities in terms of capital flow, you will also see opportunities in the capital market in terms of developing more uh, uh, solutions or financing or securities or bonds uh, in uh, the region to help to finance a much more sustainable city. Um, so when you're looking at investments within Southeast Asia, um, within this en energy transition space, how are the managers really figuring out what, what's a good investment, what is greenwashing, um, when to invest in something? I think that's why it's quite important that we need to have our own uh, kind of ESG score. Uh, at BMP Paribas Asset Management, we have our own proprietary ESG score for us to better score and understand the ESG score of companies. We have a specific criteria in terms of how we score companies. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about scoring and understanding uh, how companies are committed towards the pathway to net zero, but also helping us to uh, look at in terms of exclusion of risk, because when companies are not meeting those pathways, there are also risks in terms of uh, 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 profitability, uh, capital, and risk uh, to the capital market. Uh, the other thing, like you, you talk about, you know, it's not just exclusion. I think important when we have an ESG score, it's also help us in terms of engaging with companies to help them to meet towards the uh, pathway as expected from us as a company in terms of our internal policies. Um, having a ESG score and carbon score on the portfolio of the of our clients' investments will also help us to engage and also not just with the stakeholders, but also with our clients in terms of how we are deploying capital to make sure that they are into uh, 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 investment opportunities that's going to be not just helping them to, to, uh, to uh, achieve better returns, but also to do it in a sustainable manner. Okay. Um it's very evident that investors want to see clear outcomes uh, for green finance. And in that um, situation, with Bangladesh set to graduate from the UN's least developed country index, uh, how is it planning to sort of track the outcomes of funding? Uh, how is Dhaka in particular preparing for this? Mayor Islam, if you could share some, some insights with us. Actually, uh, that's a very important what uh, Angela, the NPP, uh, you are saying, uh, as as I, a very good platform, you know that now there is a lot of city dwellers, they don't have that kind of uh, staying, they're, in the, they're staying in the slum areas. So I need the funding here. Uh, we can do the, uh, and also the green job fund uh, as well. Number one, I need the low cost housing so I can give accommodation to my, uh, uh, to the, uh, to the migrants. I, and, and of course, I want to give them the training also, skill development training. So that's the challenges. If I can, the uh, skill development, uh, and I can, they can go to the abroad as a whole. But big challenges at this moment, as I'm saying, the everyday 2000, uh, the, I have to adapt to them. I don't know where I'm going to their education, their livelihood, their well-being, their dignity, their safety, everything. Of course, health as well. So, number one, how, uh, of course, we are trying to manage the land, but I will request to you, please, ADP also here, uh, that how we can make the building if I do the infrastructure, then of course we need to give them the train to the uh, that uh, workers. 
Uh, I'm just giving in one example. A few days back, I went to one uh, slum area I mean, in Mirpur. So I talked with the guy that why you came here. He's saying that, uh, uh, the, sir, I, uh, my, I have a big agricultural land, but which is now underwater, saline water there. So I cannot do anything. So I came uh, to Dhaka city, your city. I said, how many kids do you have? He said, I had two kids. One is 13 years and one is 17 years. I said, where they are now living? They said, no, they are already got married. I said, what? They are only 13 and 17. Why they got married? They're saying, sir, if I bring them Dhaka, where are you going to stay? So better to give them the, uh, so they got married. And they also, they one the who is 17. She also produced a, another child, but so see the effect is a spiral effect in the society. So my challenge, number one, is the low house costing. And number two, what I mean, I want to give them the skill development training program. So I will urge in this uh, round table session, please come forward and I need the justice for my people, those who are coming from the different affected area in my city. Thank you. So when you talk about low cost housing and skills development, how are you going to make sure essentially that the funds that you're getting are being used in the best possible way? Are, are the mechanisms you've come up to track that? Yeah, there is a mechanism, of course. There is, a, of course, as you know, that in our country, there's a ERD division also, extern, external resource division also from the ministry. Mm -hmm. so, so I always say that, I, I was saying to different uh, uh, agencies also, my national and international investment in climate adaptation to get at least 50% of total global climate fund direct, both in climate vulnerable regions and in fast growing cities like Dhaka. So there is a mechanism. Of course, there's a skill development. There is a, uh, you know, uh, what and low cost housing. I, I mentioned that might be, if we can talk, uh, we can find it out the space. But of course, for infrastructure, if the PNPP or the, uh, or the ADB, uh, Shonali is there, uh, so if you can sit together, uh, by the way, today I'm going to meet the ADP head, the country head in Bangladesh at 7.30 p.m. So definitely I will talk with him regarding what Sonali was saying. But definitely there is an opportunity. Being a city mayor, you can yeah. directly talk with me. Right. And of course, we'll talk with the government. Mm -hmm. And government and me we, uh, and the city corporation Definitely, we can find out a way how to do this, minimize this kind of how the channel. Definitely, it can be done. Okay. Um, so, Mayor Islam mentioned infrastructure. Um, I think the ASEAN power grid is something that's been in the works for many, many years now. Um, why is it important? What are the key hurdles right now for getting that together? So, Ishika, before I uh, comment on that, um, Maybe I can just uh, comment on some of the things that uh, Mayor Slam said. Um, you know, I, I think as you can all see that climate change is vast and far-reaching, and it impacts uh, very often most of the vulnerable communities uh, globally, uh, communities that have the least resources to combat climate change. So it really will take all of us um, to combat climate change in coming years. Um, I think the focus tends to be on energy because, mm -hmm. of course, energy is one of the primary, uh, has primary responsibility for greenhouse gas emissions. But let's not forget that transport and energy intensive industries are also big contributors to GHG emissions. Right. Uh, I think it's probably a quarter each by now. Um, uh, land use practices in agriculture, they all contribute to climate change. Um, but just to focus on your uh, question about the ASEAN grid um, and making renewable energy more available, yeah. uh, more cost-effective and more efficient, um, 
it is it makes immense sense to connect the ASEAN countries, the power grid. Um, talking about an ASEAN average on renewable energy sometimes is meaningless unless the uh, energy systems in countries are connected, because these are averages for each country. But unless the grid is connected, it's really meaningless to talk about a 23% average for the ASEAN as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. Um, renewable energy has its own peculiar uh, issues. It does tend to be site-specific, and resources are rich based on your uh, geography and your, uh, you know, physical layout of countries. So some countries are rich in hydro. Uh, some countries have very high levels of solar radiation. Other countries have very good wind. So to maximize these renewable resources in the ASEAN region, um, it would be the most efficient if the ASEAN grid was connected. And the ASEAN grid has been talked about for uh, many years. Yep. Um, there is a limited connection right now between some countries. Uh, Malaysia and Singapore are connected uh, in limited amounts. Uh, Laos exports hydropower into Thailand and Vietnam. Uh, there is a lot of hydro energy in Sarawak, but that's not connected. Um, it would be good if Singapore were also connected to Indonesia. So um, for various reasons, if you had a connected grid and you could uh, utilize uh, the best resources. So not everyone has hydro. Singapore doesn't have hydro, for example. Or uh, the upper reaches of Thailand may not have solar radiation. If you can connect the grids, then it's the best balance of complementary sources of renewable energy. Um, there is a very good project that people can look at in Rajasthan, in India, and that's a uh, a grid connection project that ADB did um, uh, maybe five or six years ago. We provided um, sovereign and private sector financing. And what it did was connected uh, wind, solar, and hydro uh, by, by connecting the different uh, grids in the north, in the west, and uh, coastal Gujarat. So that's a good example to look at. Um, and you know, if you if you connect it, you have the most efficient sources, the cheapest sources, and you can maximize the locations for um, for renewable energy. I, I find it quite interesting that we're having this conversation about Southeast Asia transiting towards transitioning rather towards renewable energy um, when the region has very severe development needs to meet as well. Um, how are countries at this stage really balancing out those two things about making sure we, we green the planet at the same time, having the basic needs of its population met? Yeah, it's a good question, and it's a question that's uh, debated very often in the development world. Yeah. Uh, you have to keep the balance between um, being responsible for our environment, and, and that responsibility uh, is for all of us. Um, not just the developing world or the developed world. Um, and to balance out the needs of uh, access to energy, because in this part of the world, in our DMCs, uh, there is a very large portion of the population that does not have basic a access to, exactly. uh, to energy. Right. Um, uh, much of rural um, Bangladesh or India still has you know, one bulb and a, and a phone charger, and mm -hmm. that's the, the only access. So developing, uh, so, sorry, balancing the needs of development and um, uh, being environmentally responsible is something that uh, multilaterals have dealt with for a long time. Yeah. For, uh, this is a question that we ask in every um, financing that we do. But the encouraging thing is that even the private sector and commercial banks now are talking about the same issues and um, uh, following the same framework uh, that that we have adopted many years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's very encouraging to see uh, both of these developing in tandem. Okay. Yes, a good food for thought, I suppose, for everyone. Uh, Angelia, would you like to add? Uh, yeah, can I just add something sure. uh, on, on that conversation? I, I think mm -hmm. uh, clearly there's a lot uh, to, to be done, and it's not like what Sonali said, when we talk about energy transition, it's not just talking about renewable energy. 
clearly, I think it's very important that government needs to have a proper structural plan um, as to how they're going to be transitioned into uh, you know, uh, a net zero uh, carbon emission uh, environment. Uh, I think while we are talking about investments into the infrastructure to help to do that, uh, I think the biggest hurdle, as I mentioned, uh, is fiscal constraint, uh, where money is coming to continue to fund uh, all these developments. Um, and, and we also know, uh, you know, it's a kind of balanced situation because, you know, corporates uh, needs to be profitable. Uh, yeah. But I think during the nascent stage, it's very difficult to be profitable. And therefore, it's important government needs to come up with a structural plan as to how they're going to move towards a net zero environment. And from there on, supported by, uh, you know, incentives and subsidies so that, you know, it helps corporate to, uh, you know, to, to fund um, and hopefully become profitable in, uh, in that journey. Uh, I, I think, uh, importantly, is also to change uh, behaviour while there is opportunities on electric vehicles. Like what Sonali has mentioned, governments are coming up with policies as to phasing out fossil fuel cars by 2030 in some countries. Uh, but you can see a lot of incentives in terms of promoting electric vehicles. Uh, we also need to recognise uh, in developing countries uh, in ASEAN, you can see that income per capita is low and a lot of these EV cars that we're talking about are usually uh, very prestige premium cars which are probably not uh, affordable mm -hmm. to many. Uh, you know, then how do we, uh, what we really need to do to incentivize the change of behavior. When we talk about energy transition, it's not just about EVs and all, again, probably building, building more um, uh, circular cities, uh, improving uh, public transport so that it's le less dependent on, uh, you know, private vehicles, uh, you know, like Singapore, as an example, has a very efficient uh, public transport system. And, and therefore, you know, we all living in Singapore, we don't even need to own a car because it's very easy to get around the city. So I think those are efforts, part of the structural plans that government needs to put in place mm -hmm. uh, for us to move towards achieving those targets. Okay. Yep. Uh, great, great thoughts from everyone. And um, I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. Thank you awesome. to the panelists for joining uh, this conversation. Thank you to everyone here for spending your day here. And I hope you found this conversation, this conference, useful. Thank you very much. Please welcome His Excellency Surangal S. Whips Jr., President of the Republic of Palau. Peng Shui Kai, CEO of Toko Crypto, and Nizchint Sanghavi, APAC Crypto Lead for Visa, for a conversation with Bloomberg's Joanna Ossinger. Welcome everyone, and I'm aware I think we're the only panel standing between you all and drinks, so we'll try to make it worthwhile. Um, so I am Joanna Ossinger, I'm Senior Reporter for Crypto at Bloomberg News. Welcome, glad to see so many people here. We have Sir Angle Whips Jr., he is the 10th President of the Republic of Palau, an island nation in the Western Pacific. We also have Peng Shui Kai, um, the co-founder of Indonesia-based crypto exchange Toko Crypto, which started up in 2018, and Nishant Sangavi, who is the regional crypto lead for APAC at Visa. So let's get started. Because it is quite late where President Whips is, we're going to talk to him first and then to the other guys. So Mr. President, thank you so much for being with us. Um, how is your digital asset strategy going? And if you want to maybe just talk, tell the audience a little bit about what you're doing and how it's faring right now. Well, first of all, Joanna, thank you for this um, opportunity to be able to join you virtually. I would have uh, loved to be there in Singapore. Uh, however, I have a meeting in Hawaii, so you're right, it's uh, almost midnight here. Uh, the Pacific Island Leaders uh, Conference is being held uh, uh, tomorrow and the day after, so I had to be here today. But uh, in your question regarding how is our strategy, uh, digital asset strategy going, I, first of all, Palau is a very small country. We only have 20,000 people. And uh, one of the things that we quickly realized with COVID and the challenges that we've had to our economy is that we, we need to diversify our economy. We need to look at ways that we can be more innovative and take advantage of new technologies. Uh, so uh, we believe that uh, what we've launched is, is going very well. Uh, the pa this uh, past year, 
uh, Palau passed the Digital Residency Act. Uh, and this really uh, allows, uh, 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 makes it vi the availability for a person to get his di digital identity um, uh, from Palau uh, and available to the global community. Um, and uh, since the time uh, that we launched it, um, it's been gaining uh, excitement, uh, but we know that there is still, uh, we need to expand the offerings that we have. So we need to continue to provide, well, if you get this digital residency, what does it allow you to do? And we are working through that and trying to, you know, uh, add to our regulations and, and make uh, things uh, uh, more beneficial to our digital residents. Uh, we, but one of the things that we wanted to make sure of uh, right off at the beginning is that uh, we, we wanted to do it correctly, we wanted to do it safely, and we also wanted to you know, look at Palau's market size and what would we be able to handle. So one of the important parts of this digital residency program is uh, that uh, to become a digital resident, uh, we run you through a, a, a rigorous uh, know your client process, a KYC process that uh, uh, every uh, participant in Palau's economy needs to go through uh, entirely virtually. And so we do a background check. We want to make sure that uh, uh, you don't have any criminal records and, and also are not on any uh, worldwide sanction list. Um, we're also uh, looking uh, and exploring other features that we could offer, um, like uh, registration of e-corporations um, so that uh, digital residents uh, can conduct business globally through Palau's uh, a convenient RNS portal. Um, we're hoping that they will be able to manage their identity, uh, contacts, and e corporations on this portal. Uh, Palau is also uh, taking a step in uh, collaborating with Ripple uh, to explore the creation of a national uh, stablecoin, which we hope to launch uh, soon, uh, and which will help make uh, payments uh, easy and secure. Uh, Palau's also been uh, very fortunate uh, to gain recognition from leaders in the blockchain industry uh, like uh, Chang Peng Zhao uh, from Bi Bi Binance who uh, was able to visit us a few months ago and, and we talked about how we can collaborate uh, on the digital residency program as well as making use of Binance Pay uh, uh, to make digital payments uh, uh, for digital residents, but also uh, uh, even participate in the local commerce. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I also had the opportunity to meet uh, virtually with uh, v Vitalik uh, uh, Buterin uh, uh, from Ethereum, and to to open up and uh, to look at opening up the RNS ID ecosystem to the developer community and, and to see Palau's digital, how Palau's digital residency can engage uh, with the concept of uh, soul-bound ID systems. Uh, this is a new world for Palau, uh, but we are excited to be part of it. Uh, one of the advantages that we have is we're small uh, and hopefully we can mobilize our government and be more adaptive to the changes uh, that need to be made in this fast-changing environment. Uh, at the core uh, of our strategy, a digital asset strategy, Palau is essentially a combination of initiatives uh, really to grow the size of our uh, dis digital participants, uh, to diversify our economy uh, into fintech, and to attract talents from uh, around the world to form partnerships and to open our ecosystem to builders and, and entrepreneurs. So. Uh, we just hope to provide that uh, platform where entrepreneurs can grow. And I think that's our ultimate goal. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so do you think that central bank digital currencies and government efforts in digital assets generally will kind of be symbiotic with the sort of private or decentralized crypto ecosystem or will they compete with those efforts? Well, I, I think we're 
we think that they, they're, they're symbiotic and they can complement each other. In fact, uh, central bank digital currencies um, is an idea that really has come out of cryptocurrencies and, and blockchain technology. Palau uh, itself, we don't have a, a central bank uh, that's established. We use U.S. dollars uh, as the official currency. Uh, in developing our collaboration with Ripple, uh, our goal is to have a USD-backed uh, uh, stablecoin, uh, which is really a step toward our, our own uh, central bank uh, current digital currency, you could say. And uh, we feel that uh, this is important and it will help uh, make uh, fiat uh, uh, on-ramping uh, easier. And, uh, and our digital residents will also have uh, banking access and, and, and through Binance Pay options uh, will make um, off-ramping easier too. So we, we really believe that um, uh, they don't compete, but they actually are symbiotic and they can help each other and strengthen the um, uh, yeah, crypto ecosystem. So, yeah. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Mr. President. I know you have to head off, but um, really appreciate you being here and for this audience. So thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so now let's go to a poll, actually. Um, do we have that coming up? If you can get out your phones. So decentralized finance projects pack complex transactions, deals, and trades into single applications. How should DeFi be regulated? Um, should you expand on existing regulatory frameworks, create DeFi licenses, or let DeFi self-regulate? Um, if you want to pull that out, vote. So, um, let's see. Okay. Um, Let's see, so okay, more people are saying DeFi licenses at this point, but existing regulatory frameworks coming on strong, but self-regulation, not so much. Okay, so that's interesting, there we go. We've got kind of an even split on the existing and the DeFi licenses, and then less for self-regulation. Okay, very interesting. Okay, Kai Anishin, on to you. Um, and Kai, I love the Batik, just have to say, representing here. Um, so what do you see in the crypto landscape right now? Where are we in the cycle? You know, summer, winter, is kind of all the fallout done? Where are we going? So based on our observation, at least what we're looking, uh, not only in Indonesia, but globally, um, on previous trend, there's always been cycles that trends, uh, four-year cycles that trends across the cryptocurrency or crypto asset markets. Um, you know, there's the accumulation phase, there's a the markup phase where demand exceeds supply, and then usually there's the distribution phase where, uh, you know, buy, typical buyers uh, start converting into sellers, where they start realizing their gains, and then you have the markdown phase where supplies exceed uh, demand. So based on the past few um, months that we have been observing, what we, I was also sharing uh, at, at the backstage right now is that uh, it shows signs of us experiencing a crypto winter. And I think that is also uh, elevated based on the current global you know, market conditions that's happening across the world. However, my take on this, or at least from, from the exchange perspective, is that uh, ultimately, this winter will essentially allow us to, because after winter, usually in Chinese terms, you say it's spring cleaning, right? Uh, there have been a lot of uh, companies that have, you know, you know, overextended their risk portfolio and caused great uh, issues to the industry in general. So, um, to sum it up, I think, yes, we, it's, the market is showing signs of a uh, crypto winter. Uh, based on you know observations, based on people we've spoken to, based on uh, what we see and observe in markets, uh, but yeah, we're still looking forward to what's going to happen. And definitely, everything happens in a cycle, so you know it's gonna it's gonna pass. And uh, looking looking forward to what's gonna come next. Okay, and Nishant, what do you think? I guess we're in the business of predicting uh, 
cycles and seasons, but I think apart from that, I think the fact of what Kai said in terms of cycles, it's true. Like we've seen multiple cycles like that in the crypto market. Uh, most of us have been through most of them. But what we've seen in the cycles is like when there is an up cycle, we see a lot of people come in the market and that includes speculators, that includes developers, that includes entrepreneurs. As these cycles peak up and start falling down, we see a lot of these speculators come out of it. But most of the time, the developers and the entrepreneurs stay. So our goal is to follow the developers and where they are going and see what kind of exciting uh, applications and protocols and stuff that they're building and how we can help them at the early stage of their businesses. So that's the way we, Visa also thinks about this and you know, follow the developers wherever they're going. Uh, we've actually seen, like, in spite of calling this a bit of winter or a bear market, we've seen that the number of developers who are active right now is probably at the highest. And there have been reports which show that you know, these developers are staying in spite of the price. So I think it's a good sign that uh, this is happening in the market. And you know, we can probably see the best products are still yet to come. OK. And so Nishant, what do you see as the most important developments coming for consumers? You know, in crypto, Web3, Metaverse, what, what do we need? And, you know, EM, for instance, is often consider what is considered one of the big use cases and bringing people up. So what are you looking at in you know, the next year, two years, as the really important things for a consumer? I mean, there are a lot of things happening at this time, right? If you see, uh, we've seen augmented reality and embedded finance uh, go up in a lot of ways, and that is actually contributing to the growth of, me growth of Metaverse. Now, again, Metaverse is going to be a place where we see users interacting with a lot of content and with each other as well. And we are here to support that kind of uh, payment mechanism. Again, whether it uses traditional payment mechanisms or the new forms of money, uh, whether it's stable coins, CBDC, it's still to be seen. But that is one area that we are definitely looking at. Uh, another one is DeFi. Now, within DeFi, we did a recent survey, and we've seen that 21% of people in Asia Pacific have said that uh, they are currently using DeFi. And the number which said that they are interested is, is probably double of that which means that there's a huge consumer appetite for DeFi. Uh, obviously now for DeFi to come into mainstream, there are multiple factors that will come into play. But over time we see uh, this merger between like in the traditional finance world and the DeFi world coming together in some way. So I think those are things that we do see uh, coming up in the future. Okay, great. And Kai, what are you saying? I think the, one of the most important is the possible collaboration between Visa and Togo Crypto, I don't know, in, in Indonesia or something <laughs> over the next uh, near course of the future. But um, something that I want to point out and something that we have been observing in Indonesia is the, the sheer interest that the governments and regulators, uh, just like how uh, His Excellency uh, of Palau has also you know, indicated, um, definitely within Indonesia, there has been a lot of interest. Um, pretty sure you guys have heard that uh, Indonesia, President Jokowi has mentioned of moving the new uh, capital over to Kalimantan. They have spoke about wanting to creating it on the metaverse. Uh, you know, how, how can they uh, look at uh, putting you know, blocks of land in the new capital on the metaverse? Um, you know, there has been um, Metaverse that was announced with uh, some of the listed companies in Indonesia. There's been Metaverse that's been announced with some of the big uh, telco companies in Indonesia. So Web3, Metaverse, and GameFi, these are the three most um, talked about uh, keywords within the VC space, within regulators in Indonesia, um, you know, to see these things come into fruition. Of course, you know, whether is it just on the surface, they just, uh, because in the metaverse, you have the front end and you have the back end, right? The front end is everything that you see in virtual. But in order for it to get it uh, implemented, um, I think some of the speakers before was also saying that there have been a lot of plans, but what we need is implementation. So I think, uh, you know, those are the things that um, we're looking forward to see implemented, especially. Uh, G20 is coming up in Indonesia, and a lot of these plans, a lot of these projects have been, uh, were being built, uh, you know, secretly, not secretly, but uh, they, were, they are being built, and they will be announced during G20. And I think that's something that, you know, in, Indonesia is very proud to be able to showcase, and also for uh, something that, you know, we can expect to see what exactly has been built. There's a lot of promises on crypto. 
but now it's time to see what, what are the real products that can actually be brought in. Um, I think there was also mention about commodities in Indonesia uh, that's coming up, right? Uh, you know, Indonesia is a country that is not very well known for its strict processes, its supply chains. So having blockchain come in to see how it could uh, make things a bit more efficient in this space is also some of the things that I think is very key and crucial in terms of the, you know, that people are expecting. Okay, so Kai, what do you think will uh, spur more adoption in digital assets, both on the retail and the institutional side? A um, couple of things. Number one, partnerships. We need, um, so we need Web2 companies, we need traditional companies, finance companies to take that step, which I'm very, I mean, just having this session itself is very promising. It's very, it gives a very positive out, uh, outlook in the space because Everyone here is a seasoned, experienced person that has been working uh, with many years of experience in, in, in the traditional finances. And to have that interest, I think that's the key thing. The next thing would be to see how we can partner up to deliver uh, and, and offer this, some of the things that I mentioned earlier, and how do we offer them to, to, the, to the people to actually be implemented. And the third thing would be regulations. Um, that is very key and crucial. Uh, at least from what we are observing in Indonesia, that has, uh, you know, that has been very um, sound policies that we put in place. Crypto is being taxed. In, in, crypto transactions are taxed in Indonesia. Uh, there's a regulatory body that is uh, governing the industry. There's reported of 50, 15, 15 million uh, retail customers in Indonesia. You know, how do we uh, take the next step? I think to expand more on these, uh, these things that I mentioned. That's my thought. Okay, and Nishant, what do you think? So I think two things are really key for the next you know, mainstream adoption. Uh, first of all, there's user experience. Uh, we've always seen in the crypto industry, like probably 10 years back also, it was a very, very complex mechanism of you know, doing anything in the crypto side. Over time, we've seen those user experiences become much better and it's more seamless. But I think for the next generation of people to come in, it has to be as seamless as with the knowing that there's probably nothing be in crypto right now. It could be something uh, like crypto in the back, uh, you know, which is powering, which could be blockchain, but it doesn't have to be uh, something which is full of jargons, something which is full of you know, multiple hoops to jump. So I think that user experience becomes a critical aspect of it. Uh, the second part is security. I mean, we've all seen in crypto, you know, security has been one of the biggest concerns, you know, whether it's uh, on smart contract hacks, you know, exchange hacks, a uh, lot of other phishing attempts and all of the things which are happening right now. Now, for that, the, the industry will really need to mature and you know, come up with newer security measures, uh, especially in things like DeFi. That's where I think uh, a lot of the traditional institutions and financial institutions which have been doing this, you know, being certified for years, can come and give the expertise to uh, you know, the traditional the crypto players and the crypto native players. So I think that, again, talking again of that whole merger between you know, the traditional financial institutions and the crypto world uh, becomes even more important at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And um, so I guess quick answers on the last two if you can, but um, what do you see as particularly promising or challenging in ASEAN since we're at an ASEAN conference, Nishant? Uh, I think in terms of uh, ASEAN particularly, again, because there's a different, like multiple of geographies, right? It's very hard to give a particular answer specific only to ASEAN, but I think uh, we've seen this growth of CBDCs and stablecoin regulation coming in, and I think that can become a very critical factor of how this market grows. So we have to see like, how uh, each of different regulators look at this and uh, look at stablecoins in general. Okay, and Kai? Um, I think some of the challenges that we see and face right now is I think everyone, everyone thinks everything needs to be tokenized or you need to create a uh, a crypto token out of it all. But I think fundamentally we need to go back to uh, what can, what you know, processes can fundamentally be not tokenized, but looking at um, adopting blockchain technology uh, in, uh, into those processes. So I think, I think in general is to make people understand that um, blockchain technology is not all about cryptocurrency and going to the moon, but fundamentally, like what Nishin mentioned, it's also about how the technology can fundamentally, fundamentally power uh, services that we are so used to and aware to, but not actually knowing that 
what we are using is actually powered by this technology. So. Okay, and so last question, two minutes each. Um, what does the future of money look like? Is it central bank digital currencies? Is it crypto? What's going to survive out of all the stuff that's happening right now, Kai? Um, definitely, I think CBDC is uh, something that would come up and, and you know, st start to show itself more uh, as uh, in the next couple of years with the growing interest, definitely from, I think the last was uh, Governor of Bank Indonesia actually stepped up and was talking about uh, CBDCs in Indonesia and with G20 coming up, I think that's that some shape and form of it will be starting to, to come up and something that we can you know, start seeing what exactly have they been planned. We've been involved in a lot of focus group discussions with uh, Baitly as well. Uh, OJK has also come up uh, and, and mentioned, uh, the new chairman of OJK also came out to mention about crypto. Uh, so yeah, my perspective is that CBDC will definitely lead the charge uh, in the next uh, you know, in the next uh, wave of uh, cryptos. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And Nishant, what do you think? I think the future of, you know, payments is definitely digital. We've seen, you know, massive adoption in, through the pandemic. Uh, I think in terms of uh, stablecoin and CBDC, I would definitely see regulated governed stablecoins. Those can almost become like an alternate payment rail to what other systems are today, whether it's an RTP system, whether it's a card system, they will definitely be an alternate rail. Uh, CBDC is also now, it will probably take a little bit more time to mature, but that will also come eventually uh, to serve all the Web3 ecosystem. So I think those, both of those are uh, pretty likely to succeed. Okay, excellent. Um, well, I appreciate both of you making the time to do this, and thank you to you all for being here. Um, and actually now, I um, well, actually if we can thank the panelists and I think we're gonna have some words from um, Mark Miller who is our uh, global editor for Be Live. But first, thanks to these guys for, for their thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. So that brings us to the close of our program today. Thank you all very much for joining us here. It is, as uh, I think Haslinda said at the beginning, exciting to see people uh, in person. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers and my Bloomberg colleagues uh, who served as moderators. Thanks uh, most of all to our presenting sp sponsor, Standard Charter, for making this summit uh, possible today. Thank you uh, for being in an engaged uh, audience. And if you want to see any part of this event, you can go to our website, which is BloombergLive.com, and watch um, the videos on demand. You can also check out there at the website our upcoming events, which we have a full slate still through the rest of the year in the U.S., Middle East, uh, Europe, and of course here in Asia. And last, I'm going to say please proceed out to the foyer. Uh, for our uh, networking buffet, grab some food, come back in here, meet uh, with more people, uh, and, uh, and, and talk about what you've heard today. Uh, and thank you very much. We appreciate you coming.